morning. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor John Cam. Professor Cam doesn't really need much of an introduction because he's very well known. Um, I don't know, John, if you remember, but when I was back with, uh, with uh, George, uh, I was going to try to go and spend a year with you in Merrick Malik. And yeah. uh, unfortunately, I was funded by the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Ontario. And back then, you know, the Canadian dollar was really bad. So I, I decided not to, to go and ended up going to Virginia with Ken Ellenbogen and doing network. But one of the things that I actually loved from the letter that you sent me that, yeah, sure, you can come, was uh, you had all these, you know, like all of us, FESC, FAC, and all that stuff. But there was one that I couldn't figure out that was, you know, HMS something, and it was when you were <laughs> His Majesty's physician. So yeah. we are in the present here, presence of Dr. Cam, who among many of his chores, he is or was, I don't know, the physician of the queen. So uh, great chore. Now, Professor Cam is the British Heart Foundation Professor of Clinical Cardiology. He was the chief of cardiovascular sciences for over two decades at St. George University, and he's still a professor there. He has many interests in uh, cardiac arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, stroke prevention, and anticoagulation. He's been the PI, co-PI steering committee, or in the DSMB of most of the landmark clinical trials in many areas in cardiac arrhythmias and cardiology in general. He is the editor of the European Society of Cardiology textbook of cardiovascular medicine in the ESC CardioMed, electrophysiology of the heart clinical cardiology and evidence-based cardiology. He has read and or edited more than 40 books. Uh, one of those was one that I uh, wrote for that series on WPW that uh, John was the editor. He uh, has co-authored more than 1,500 papers and more than 500 book chapters and in excess of uh, 2,500 accepted abstracts. And he has delivered more than 1,000 international lectures. We had the pleasure of having him here in person a couple of years ago. He has been involved in the production of numerous guidelines, including the ESC guidelines for the management of atrial fibrillation, and is the holder of the European Society of Cardiology Gold Medal and the British Cardiovascular Society McKenzie Medal. So, John, it's a great pleasure to have you here. And uh, John is today going to give us a nice lecture on what's new on anticoagulation and atrial fibrillation. Well. Thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, it's very kind of you to invite me to uh, speak to you all, and I'm very pleased to be able to do that. I am very sorry, of course, that this is just a virtual meeting, but it does have some disadvantages. It cuts down all the unnecessary traveling, and it's good to be able to do it without spending a lot of time on aeroplanes. So thank you again for your invitation and thank you for the introduction. As you can see in London today, we have a nice sunny day. It's unusual, we've had a very bad summer. Usually the temperature has been less than 20 almost every day, but today it's more than 30. So forgive me if I am uh, uh, get a little hot wearing this suit. I'm going to talk, as you can see from my first slide, about what's new in anticoagulation, management, uh, the management of patients with atrial fibrillation, specifically dwelling on factor 10A inhibition. And I'd like to remind you that this talk is sponsored by uh, Bayer Canada, and therefore many of the illustrations that I will give you will focus on rivaroxaban, but in most instances, what I say about rivaroxaban applies to other factor 10A inhibitors as well. I will mention when occasional issues are not replicated by other factor 10A inhibitors. I think we should look at my conflicts of interest because as you see from the slide, they look to be substantial, but most of these are just related to professional society work, clinical trials, editing, and issues of that sort. And they're very little to do with uh, the issues related to uh, working for companies. But at the bottom of the slide, uh, 
you can see, I think, that I have worked for companies and amongst them is Bayer. Please bear all that in mind. Let me start by addressing the issue of uh, the problems that we have uh, with uh, elderly people. I want to uh, firstly uh, address this slide. I'm sorry, it's a bit uh, scrappy. Um, I wanted it to talk predominantly about anticoagulation issues in patients who are elderly. And elderly patients, as you well know, have many comorbidities. And three of the comorbidities, which are very important, are atrial fibrillation, CKD, and diabetes mellitus. All of these conditions, including age itself, are associated with an increased likelihood of stroke. Yeah. Fold, it's, it's round. For example, uh, for uh, diabetes, fivefold for atrial fibrillation, about a 60% increase with CKD. Yeah, and every 10 years of life after the age of 55 doubles the risk of stroke. There's a very close interrelationship between these comorbidities, as you can see from the percentage figures that I put on this slide. For example, diabetes occurs in about 30% of patients who have atrial fibrillation and CKD in about 35% and so on. So they're very closely intertwined. Now, apart from the comorbidities, of course, elderly patients have many other challenges such as bleeding risks, sticking to the drugs, polypharmacy, mobility issues, falls, cognitive impairment, and so on. So they represent a real challenge for anticoagulation. But let me just show you the basic problem that we have with the elderly. And that is that as age advances, of course, the likelihood of an ischemic stroke increases. You can see the patients with atrial fibrillation have a very high likelihood of developing an ischemic stroke as they move past their 70s and into the 80s. At the same time, of course, we see that if they're managed with anticoagulants, and these data refer to warfarin, you see that the possibility of bleeding is very much higher in elderly patients, in this case, over 80 years of age, compared with younger patients. Now that gives rise to a real challenge. And the challenge is that there is an unmet need for safe anticoagulation in the elderly. This slide illustrates that the older the patient becomes, the less likely they are to be anticoagulated, and yet the greater the need for anticoagulation. Physicians are often tempted not to anticoagulate an old patient simply because of their age, fearing, of course, that bleeding will be an unforgivable and difficult complication and one that he may be responsible for. However, let's have a look at uh, some data from the Garfield AF registry, a large registry of nearly 55,000 patients who were uh, recruited 2010 to 2016 in 35 countries across the world. You can see that in elderly patients, in this case, over the age of 80, we see that at best, even the most risk, stroke risk patients with a CHADSVAS score of three or more are only anticoagulated in less than 70% of the cases. And yet, if we look at the same database, we can see that when we compare vitamin K antagonists or NOAC treatment to no treatment, there is a clear advantage to anticoagulation. And yet, this advantage is often ignored by physicians. Let's have a look specifically at NOAC therapy and contrast it 
with therapy with a vitamin K antagonist. To do that, let's just have a quick glance at Christian Ruff's meta-analysis of the four phase three pre-approval trials for the NOAC drugs. And here you see with an age division at 75 years that those over 75 have at least the same sort of advantage without, in terms of stroke reduction, without an increase in bleeding more than their younger counterparts. The p-values for interaction are all negative with regard to age. So NOAC therapy certainly has the same kind of advantage in the elderly as it does in the young. And this has been, of course, amply illustrated also by so-called real-world evidence. Here's a data set which was recently published from Taiwan. In these 15,000 patients, you can see that each of the three NOAC drugs that were available in Taiwan, the Bigotran, Apixaban, and Rivaroxaban, all of these major cardiovascular outcomes are tending to favor NOAC drugs, in some cases significant, in other cases not quite making significance, largely, I think, because of the differences in the numbers of patients taking each of these anticoagulant drugs in this particular database. But the general message is NOAC seem to be better in real-world data than vitamin K antagonists. And specifically, if we look at Rivaroxaban, the SAFIR study, which we published last year, shows clearly in these patients with an average age of 86, that the major bleeding rate is cut by half, intracerebral hemorrhage by two thirds. You can see that there's a trend towards a reduction in stroke and a strong trend towards a reduction in mortality. So I think it's pretty clear to all of us that there is an advantage to the use of oral anticoagulants and particularly NOAC drugs. In the prefer in AF registry, which took place in some seven European countries in university hospital settings, we can see that NOACs seem to be better than vitamin K antagonists in terms of the uh, net composite outcome, the significant reduction, the components of that, uh, which are major bleeding and ischemic events, both better with no X, although not uh, always strongly, significantly so. And if we look at the ischemic events, we can divide those into cardiac and vascular into the, and when we do that, we can see that vascular and cardiac events are all reduced as well. Looking at the separate NOACs, we see that uh, all three seem to be reducing the event rate compared with a vitamin K antagonist, but in this case, rivaroxaban is significant and the others don't quite make that significance, but I'm sure there's not much difference between them. And if we look at frail patients, not all of these are necessarily elderly, but in frail patients, we see exactly the same kind of data, a definite advantage in this case for rivaroxaban compared with warfarin. Now, this is a particular issue because frail patients, even more and elderly patients tend not to be anticoagulated. And these data are really stunning to me. You can see in this meta-analysis, looking at frail patients compared with non-frail patients, that there is a 50% almost reduction in the percentage of patients who are actually anticoagulated. And this is inexplicable in many ways, because the data with frail patients is equally strong to that in old patients. Let's move to another facet of the elderly patient, and that is prevention. 
I think we all appreciate that the menopause is increased in patients who have atrial fibrillation. It's an increase not only in vascular dementia, but interestingly, and for me at least at present, for no good reason or obvious reason, also Alzheimer's is very much increased, roughly doubled in patients with atrial fibrillation. But we see from these data from the Swedish national database that the use of an oral anticoagulant clearly is an advantage. And the Swedes also demonstrated that the longer the time in the therapeutic range with warfarin and that no act drugs better than warfarin reduce the progression of dementia. And you can see from this slide also that this finding is particularly noted in patients in the 60 to 75 year age group, which of course is the period when uh, dementia is becoming apparent, rapidly apparent. We also know that when comparative studies have been done in the real world setting, because there's no randomized trial comparing one NOAC with another, but no, firstly, NOACs are very effective. Secondly, that if we look at differences between NOACs, that rivaroxaban seems to be marginally better in this particular database from Korea. And you see the results with rivaroxaban on the right-hand side of the slide, a reduction in 27% reduction in the development of dementia. We can, of course, look at a number of real-world data sets. I've just shown you the Korean database, but there's also Danish, Swedish, and US market scan reports dealing with dementia. And you see in the Korean and the US data, clearly is an advantage to no act drugs compared with vitamin K antagonists. It's less clear in the Swedish national registers. It only appeared in relatively low risk cases of fibrillation. In the Danish registers, the point estimate didn't move much to the left of the line of unity. And for older patients, it was just the reverse, the vitamin K antagonist beating the NOAC drugs. Now, before we leave specifically the elderly patient, I thought I should just remind you of this trial called Elder Care. It's a trial that's uh, appeared in the New England Journal a year ago but it's still not well known to many people. And the reason it's not well known is it dealt with adoxaban and many countries are not using much adoxaban. And secondly, because it dealt with a non-approved dose of adoxaban. It took patients who were elderly, they were 80 years or over, and they had reasons why a standard dose of the anticoagulant couldn't be administered. You see the reasons uh, on the left-hand side of the slide, it, renal function, body weight issues, and safe treatment, and so on. But the patients were then treated with an ultra-low dose of adoxaban, 15 milligrams a day of adoxaban. And you see from the two sets of Kaplan-Meier curves that stroke and systemic embolism was very significantly reduced and that bleeding risks were less, although not significantly less. Now, th this I think is an, a very interesting trial, but one that's seriously criticized, of course, because relatively small and because a large number of patients discontinued therapy. And we don't really know what happened to them or why they discontinued treatment. But it does point to a possible use of a lower dose of anticoagulants in very high risk patients, sometimes because of difficulties with elimination of the anticoagulant, but also in other circumstances. Now, another issue that we have with the elderly, of course, is polypharmacy. And there have been many attempts to try and compare vitamin K antagonists with no act drugs. The reason, of course, that this is such an interesting issue is because one of our major concerns with using vitamin K antagonists was 
the drug-drug interaction profile of drugs like warfarin. And uh, the NOAC or DOAC drugs were introduced with a fanfare suggesting that this would not be a problem. And so it's of considerable interest that studies have not shown a tremendous advantage for NOAC drugs with and without polypharmacy. In this case, in this study, greater than nine, equal or greater than nine other prescriptions constituted polypharmacy. And if we look at the performance of these drugs, apixaban, rivaroxaban, and warfarin, you see there's pressure <laughs> in terms of major bleeding and mortality in this study. So it's rather disappointing that we were unable to demonstrate any advantage to NOAC drugs so far. Now, moving on to look at renal impairment, because that again is a significant issue in the elderly, as I've already explained. And you know, I'm sure, that stroke, major bleeding, and all-cause mortality are all very significantly increased, roughly doubled in uh, the patient with renal impairment. And you can see also that uh, the incidence is dependent on the severity of the renal impairment. Again, data from Garfield on the right-hand side of the slide showing that some moderate to severe CKD where you see the big increase in uh, the rate of stroke and systemic embolism. So CKD is another challenge. If one of the reasons it's a challenge is because many physicians do not appreciate that renal elimination is important for all of the NOAC drugs. It's particularly important, of course, with the bigger trial. 80% uh, renal elimination, also a doctor van, 50%, but the other two drugs, between 25 and 30% uh, renal elimination. And therefore, renal impairment often requires some adjustment of dose. That's particularly so for rivaroxaban, because it's the only criterion, but for apixaban and bigotran, it's also very relevant as for, and uh, adoxaban also, of course. But you can see from these very interesting data, physicians don't really appreciate this well enough. Take, for example, patients who have a creatinine clearance of 15 to 15 mils per minute. With rivaroxaban, they should be using only 15 milligrams daily. But you can see from this slide that 40% of patients in this category were treated with the full dose of rivaroxaban. There are also some with threatening which is less than 15, who should not receive the drug at all, who get treated with rivaroxaban sometimes at the highest possible dose. And you can see from the outcomes illustrated on the right of this slide that clearly there's a disadvantage to inappropriate therapy and an advantage to appropriate therapy. Now, looking again at the phase three trials and harking back to the rough meta-analysis, you see again that a low creatinine clearance, 50 or less, or 50 to 80, compared with a normal, let's say over 80 mils per minute, is associated with, if anything, with more advantage uh, compared with warfarin treatment in these clinical trials. You see that for stroke and systemic embolism, although the p-value for interaction is negative, there's no clear advantage to lower renal function in that regard. And similarly for major bleeding. But what we can say is that our drugs are obviously as good as a vitamin K antagonist in patients with even quite moderate severity of renal impairment. A particularly interesting issue, of course, has arisen when people started looking at what happened not only to cardiovascular outcomes, but to renal outcomes in patients who were treated with vitamin K antagonists and with NOAC drugs. And here's, I think, the study that started it off mostly. It was a Mayo Clinic study, 
reported by Yao and colleagues, they looked at patients who were taking these drugs, they used propensity matching to make sure that the, uh, there were minimal differences between the groups. Uh, they looked at renal outcomes, such as the 30% decline in EGFR, a doubling of serum creatinine or acute kidney injury. They looked at NOACs as a whole, and you see there was almost a 30% or 23% incidence uh, reduction in the 30% uh, decline in the EGFR. There was almost a 40% reduction in doubling of creatinine and so, so on. And they also looked at the NOACs individually. The Bigotran and River Oxivan seemed to perform the better of the three in this particular case. But again, uh, it's difficult with studies of this nature to claim that one drug is better than another drug when they're all compared against uh, yet another drug. But uh, this general principle has been shown time and again with NOAC drugs, not only with the river octaban, although I'm again illustrating an American uh, market scan uh, database study at the moment, and you can see that a acute kidney injury and development of stage five CKD in these patients who didn't have severe renal impairment when they entered with treatment with anticoagulants, it was 20% better uh, with rivaroxaban than it was with warfarin for either developing acute kidney injury or stage five CKD or dialysis. And in the antenna study, which is a study which was reported uh, the week before last in uh, the, the ESC 2021 Congress, you can see in this Spanish study that a 100% increase in serum creatinine uh, was uh, less in patients treated with rivaroxaban, a 37% reduction compared with those treated with warfarin. And a greater than 30% decline in EGFR was also less in patients treated with rivaroxaban, a 24% reduction. And end stage kidney disease, not statistically significant, but a point estimate in favor of uh, rivaroxaban rather than uh, vitamin K antagonist. Now, what are the reasons for all this? And this is perhaps a fascinating part of this particular storyboard. It could be, of course, simply that the factor 10A inhibitor is reducing factor 10A, obviously, and consequentially the power signaling triggered by factor 10A, which will reduce inflammation, fibrosis, and abnormal cell growth and reduce so-called power-induced nephropathy. On the other hand, it could be related to the avoidance of acute kidney injury which is thought to relate to a reduction in thrombin uh, and factor seven and protein C, which give rise to apoptosis, inflammation, and uh, a decrease in barrier protection. That causes glomerular hemorrhage and acute kidney injury, and that can go on to progressive renal impairment. Perhaps it's the third mechanism, which is the most likely, and potentially the most interesting, and that is that uh, vascular calcification is inhibited by matrix proteins, which when carboxylated uh, are active, and the carboxylation is vitamin K dependent. And therefore, if you use a vitamin K antagonist, you inhibit that activation and you allow vascular calcification. There are a number of studies now in atrial fibrillation patients and in sinus rhythm patients demonstrating that uh, treatment with a vitamin K antagonist increases renovascular and peripheral and valvular and other vascular forms of uh, calcification. And that may be an important mechanism for uh, avoiding renal impairment in patients taking NOAC. So on this slide, you see that vitamin K is a fundamental uh, agent to allow carboxylation of these matrix proteins. 
And these matrix proteins are important for inhibiting vascular calcification, for uh, reducing uh, the risk of fracture, and potentially for improving insulin sensitivity. All of those, I think, have now been demonstrated with no act drugs. This, for example, is fracture risk in patients. Here, I'm demonstrating just uh, no acts as a whole, rivaroxaban and dabigatran, uh, and we're looking at data which comes from an uh, observational study, and you see that no act, rivaroxaban and dabigatran, separately on these slide on this slide, reduce the likelihood of rib fracture and osteoporosis. There is one much larger study with uh, river oxaban, as you can see, it was about 11, 12,000 patients altogether. It comes from Hong Kong. And the reduction of river oxaban is very substantial. It's about a 50% reduction in uh, osteoporosis and uh, uh, osteoporotic rib fractures. The meta-analysis on the right shows that all the studies that have been reported at, up to that time had been consistent with a reduction in uh, osteoporosis or osteoporotic rib fractures, and the reduction was uh, very significant, particularly in the Lao study. One more point about uh, patients uh, who are elderly and who have risks not only of stroke and bleeding, but also major cardiovascular events or MACE. There was a report at the European Congress a couple of weeks ago introducing what was called the two MACE score. And you can see what that is, two points for metabolic syndrome, one point for myocardial infarction or revascularization, two points for an age over 75, one for congestive heart failure with an EF less than 40, and uh, one point for thromboembolism or stroke. Two Ms means metabolic syndrome and myocardial infarction, and then ACE. And this score was used particularly uh, because if you look at patients in this EMEA Spanish database, you see that if you simply use age, to dichotomize the patient, there is not an increase in maze associated purely with being older. Whereas if you use this two maze score, you can see a very much more uh, carefully dissected maze risk using the two maze score. So that's of some interest, particularly in patients who have atrial fibrillation, and in this data set, uh, rivaroxaban was the anticoagulant that was being used. Now, I'd like to move on to diabetes, which is, as we all know, a global epidemic, massive increase just in the last decade of about 60%. We know that there are approaching now 500 million patients uh, around the world living with diabetes, which is about 10% of the adult population. Many of these patients are unaware of their diabetic status. About one in four patients with AF has diabetes and the presence of diabetes, as I've already indicated, increases the risk of stroke. Of course, uh, diabetes and atrial fibrillation have been linked together for some time. It's about something of the order of 20 to 30%, let's say, uh, one in three or one, uh, one in four patients with atrial fibrillation will have diabetes. That, of course, has microvascular and macrovascular complications associated with it. Diabetes does appear in the risk stratification for stroke, whether you use the Canadian system or the straightforward CHADS2 or the CHADS-VAS score. If we uh, look at why diabetes causes uh, atrial fibrillation. There's a whole array of potential diabetic complications which will lead to atrial remodeling, also lead to changed blood constituents and to oxidative stress and inflammation. 
This in turn will lead to atrial remodeling, which will promote atrial fibrillation, will also lead to platelet activation and endothelial damage. Therefore, we have in atrial fibrillation patients, all three of Verkov's triad, MET and stroke and systemic embolism is an obvious potential complication. We know, again, here from Garfield, we can see that in the diabetic patients compared with the uh, non-diabetic patient, there is an increase in all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, non-cardiovascular mortality, non-hemorrhagic stroke, ischemic stroke, that is, and major bleeding. And if we look at the anti-diabetic therapy that we choose, we can see that some of these therapies will effectively reduce the development of atrial fibrillation. It's probably true for metformin, although the studies are relatively old and relatively small. Thiazolidine dions, yes, and SGLT2 inhibitors, definitely yes. And quite possibly uh, also the DPP4 inhibitors. Uh, on this particular slide, it doesn't demonstrate the DPP4 effect, but there are some studies showing a reduction of the development of atrial fibrillation with that therapy. But what I want to concentrate on most is the SGLT2 uh, trials. There are many of them, as you know, and involving three or four of these drugs. And we can see that meta-analyses show a convincing reduction of about 20% in the likelihood that atrial fibrillation will develop when diabetic patients are treated with these drugs. We also know that not only will we reduce the likelihood of atrial fibrillation, but we will also reduce the likelihood of stroke. The meta-analysis on the lower left of this slide uh, shows, as you can see, uh, an approximately um, 32% uh, relative risk associated with SGLT2 inhibitors with regard to embolic stroke. And we see that this is effective in patients who have diabetes, CKD, and heart failure, and that perhaps daphoglyphosine uh, is the one with the most data, but you can see that the effect is shared with canagliflozin and empagliflozin, as you see there. Now, coming to anticoagulation in the diabetic, the treatment of diabetics and non-diabetics in the phase three approval trials really didn't show much difference between diabetes and non-diabetes. That's particularly so if you look at the data, for example, with the doxaban in Engage, and to a large extent with the Bigatran in Rely. There was one small difference with the Pixaban, the reduction in major bleeding that had been seen in non-diabetics in Aristotle was not the same with diabetics. As you see, the point estimates on the line of unity with regard to major bleeding in diabetics with uh, Pixaban. In Rocket AF with Rivaroxaban, most of it was identical, but as you see, there was a statistically significant reduction in vascular deaths in the diabetic that was not seen in the non-diabetic. So some small differences were seen in these data. If we look in real world data, we can see in this study, which was quite a large study of uh, 2,291 pairs of patients treated with either a NOAC drug or a vitamin K antagonist warfarin, that there was a, a reduction of about 32% uh, in the likelihood of the composite outcome of stroke, systemic embolism, ICH, major bleeding, bleeding from other sites and all cause mortality. The major reductions were in stroke and ACM and ICH and other bleeding, but not with major gastrointestinal bleeding. Specifically with rivaroxaban from these data uh, that come again from the Far East, we can see a 27% reduction in systolic embolism, 
a 21% reduction in major bleeding and a 48% reduction in intracranial hemorrhage. But this is combining not only the data from the clinical trials, but also published real world data from the US, for example, and other sources. Now, again, returning to the renal impairment issue, but now in diabetic patients, we can see very similar results for rivaroxaban, a reduction in the development of end-stage renal disease and acute kidney injury. And in this study coming from Europe, we can see also a reduction in end-stage renal disease with a Pixaban treatment, although it didn't reduce, in this study, acute kidney injury. And if we look at the so-called Caliper study, uh, which looked at patients who didn't have uh, stage 5 CKD or kidney failure or dialysis, we can see that patients treated with warfarin more often progressed to that situation, whether they were or were not diabetic. So the lower line is the diabetic patient with uh, uh, CKD 3 and 4, and you can see that it's just the same as the non-diabetic patient. Now, of course, one of the major concerns in the diabetic patient is that they may develop major adverse limb events. We're all familiar with that, particularly in the younger patients, cardiovascular death may be increased. It's not so strongly seen in the more elderly patients. There are less diabetics, it's less serious if the patients uh, live to a very low, old age. And we can see the massive increase in major adverse limb events uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, particularly so uh, a decade or so ago, much less so now, but still a very important distinction between normals and diabetics. So it was with considerable interest that we saw this study reported by Baker, in which he demonstrated that major limb amputations, in this case, patients treated with rivaroxaban were very dramatically reduced compared with those treated with warfarin in this particular database setting. We also see that endovascular revascularization was also significantly reduced. So this was, uh, I think, uh, an eye-opener for many people. It followed, of course, the COMPASS trial with low-dose rivaroxaban in patients with sinus rhythm, but here we have patients in AF treated with the full dose of rivaroxaban. And this has been followed by other studies, in this case, <clears throat> a study coming uh, from uh, Taiwan, and you can see with each of the NOAC drugs that there is a tendency to a reduction in revascularization, lower limb amputation, and uh, major adverse limb events combined. There were significant results in this latter category with rivaroxaban and with uh, dabigatran. Pixaban didn't quite make it, and neither did dadoxaban in this particular study. But you can see that the point estimates are all in the same order, and I strongly suspect that this may be an effect that all NOACs share. We had a recent a uh, new study uh, called RIVA-DM, which was reported in part at the ESC. And we see here in this study that there is a reduction in the classical outcomes associated with atrial fibrillation uh, and anticoagulation. So these reductions, particularly in major bleeding and ICH, but also in vascular death in this study and stroke combined with vascular death, but also in these more microvascular elements of diabetes. So a reduction in diabetic nephropathy, which wasn't quite significant, but also in major adverse limb events and in the need for dialysis or renal transplantation. And one last thought about diabetes. Mentioned, I mentioned before the need for vitamin K-dependent carboxylation of matrix proteins in order to activate 
uh, various issues such as insulin sensitivity. And that's something which is of interest because it's been demonstrated in several databases, here one in Taiwan, that patients who are treated with NOAC drugs have less tendency to develop atrial fibrillation. So that's, I think, of some interest, uh, but we're waiting for better studies to confirm that. So let me conclude at this point by reminding us all that the patient with atrial fibrillation, at risk of stroke and systemic embolism, and at risk from bleeding events, if we anticoagulate the patient, also has a myriad of other problems. And many of these comorbidities must be drawn into the equation when we choose therapy and think about how to manage them. I want to conclude just five points that approximately one in three patients with AF has a major comorbidity, that diabetes will increase the risk of stroke, CV death, renal function decline, major adverse limb events, and irreversible complications, that renal impairment in patients with atrial fibrillation is at last, least partly dependent on renal function, renal impairment may be lessened with DOAC or NOAC treatment. Elderly patients with AF are at high risk of bleeding and ischemic stroke. Bleeding is increased by anticoagulation, but net clinical benefit is definitely reduced. And finally, the choice of, ampli uh, of the anticoagulant is fundamentally important. And it's clear evidence in most of these contexts that NOAC drugs may be better than vitamin K antagonists. Thank you very much. Uh, thank uh, you, John. That was a tour de force. A lot of uh, interesting information. So let me ask you something. There is a lot of uh, information there about, you know, the beneficial effects of 10A inhibitors in multiple areas, not, you know, renal preservation, prevention of diabetes, even potentially prevention of, of AFib. So kind of like, uh, uh, you know, what uh, statins were doing in the, you know, in the 80s, all these pleiotropic effects. So um, let me ask you, is this a, a, a class effect? So are the 10A inhibitors better than, you know, the only thrombin inhibitors in this sense? Uh, we don't have a lot of data with thrombin inhibitors in these uh, comorbidities. When we do have the data, the bigger trend seems to be similar to the 10A inhibitors. But let me remind you, that all of these are comparisons with vitamin K antagonists. And it's really the vitamin K antagonist that has all of these pleiotropic effects. And the vitamin K antagonist, the, the NOAC or DOAC drug does not have the, these problems. And therefore osteoporosis is less than with warfarin treated patients and so on. Uh, so it's not so much that the vitamin T, 10A uh, drug has lots of pleiotropism. It's that warfarin has a lot of adverse pleiotropism. Okay. So there's a question here, whether there is a population that you would recommend treating with low dose, 15 milligrams edoxaban. It's an interesting question. I've raised that study because I think it's going to lead to further studies because we do have this residue of about 20 or 30 percent of patients who are not anticoagulated, often for seemingly good reasons. And those good reasons might be capable of being managed by using lower doses of anticoagulants. Now, I know lots of doctors do this off the cuff, so to speak. They look at a patient, a frail patient, an old patient, a patient with this, that, and the other, and think, well, if I'm going to anticoagulate this patient, I'm not going to use the full dose. That in most instances is hazardous because the full dose is far more effective than the reduced dose. But in the setting of patients who will definitely not receive an anticoagulant, like the group that was studied in the elder care trial, there may be some advantage from using a lower dose of an anticoagulant. But 
my caution is to wait for more studies because as I mentioned, elder care did have a lot of difficulties with interpretation given that so many patients discontinued the trial and we don't know what happened to them. You think we're gonna to get to the point in which we're gonna start these medications in people that only are at high vascular risk and don't necessarily have atrial fibrillation? You know, forget about atrial fibrillation, treat these people early on, start with a low intermediate dose, and then once you declare yourself with atrial fibrillation, just bump it up? I think that's quite possible, but it's a little bit down the line from now. <laughs> I think that uh, we're beginning to get the notion that uh, vascular disease can be managed with so-called low-dose vascular protective doses of NOAC drugs, particularly rivaroxaban, since that's the one that's been studied in depth. Uh, and clearly that is inadequate for most patients with atrial fibrillation because of other thrombogenic mechanisms operating in AF. Uh, so if a patient does progress from sinus rhythm with vascular disease into atrial fibrillation, clearly we have to move from the 2.5 vascular protective dose into the <laughs> stroke preventing dose of uh, uh, 15 or 20, depending on renal function. But in gen your general uh, question about the trend, I think is one that we may see develop in the future. There are lots of uh, studies that are beginning to be hatched to look further at that. So any insight on why haven't we been able to show that polypharmacy in these elderly patients really has an interaction with, uh, with NOAX? What's going on there? Well, in the real world, I suspect it's largely because uh, lots of the potential polypharmacy with vitamin K antagonists is avoided. Even, I mean, just listing the fact that somebody takes nine drugs doesn't necessarily mean that there's a distinct polypharmacy drug-drug interaction there. So that may be the main reason. But on the other hand, in the clinical trials, for example, it's quite clear that in the vast majority of circumstances, polypharmacy did not play a role. It's only in small settings that there seem to be drug-drug interaction difficulties. Uh, and it's the, the interactions, of course, are very well known with um, vitamin K and agonists and easily avoided. With the NOAC or DOAC drug, many physicians don't understand at all that drug-drug interactions are a difficulty. And I recommend, if anybody's interested, uh, to take a look at the European Heart Rhythm Association practical guide on NOAC. Uh, treatment because that has, I think, about 10 pages of drug drug interactions. It's amazing for with no act drugs. It's quite amazing that we simply have not achieved that objective when we move from vitamin K antagonist to a DOAC. Yeah, I agree. That's a great document. Last question is that, you know, it's been kind of over a decade that we have availability of this, these drugs, and there's still all these perceptions about uh, you know, not uh, giving the right dose, not giving the drug to the people in the highest risk that are the elderly, frail people. How do we change that? You know, how do we expedite a little bit the knowledge translation? There's huge amount of real world data, clinical trials larger than any other topic we've done. How, how do we change that? Well, I agree with you, the data are there. We know that net clinical benefit is advantageous for when you anticoagulate rather than do not anticoagulate a patient. But physicians don't see that as the main issue. They see before them a patient at risk from hemorrhage. And under those circumstances, they either reduce the dose or they fail to anticoagulate or they use an antiplatelet drug rather than an anticoagulant drug. All three of those maneuvers is generally, but not always, but generally inappropriate. And it's trying to get that message across, which is proving so difficult because the physician blames himself for the anticoagulation adverse events and he blames God or some other factor for the stroke risk in the first place. So I think it's, uh, it's an 
important issue. And we all, as doctors who do know a little about this, must uh, try and reinforce whenever we speak to our colleagues. Okay, well, John, thanks. That was a fantastic overview and uh, lots of new 